Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for another One Book, One New Orleans virtual event. I'm Megan Holt, the executive director. I'm so excited to be bringing you an evening in the archives, the Tom Dent Papers. Before we get rolling tonight, I would like to thank the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. This event was made partially possible by their grant from the Louisiana Culture Cares Act. Thank you so much for supporting the arts and culture in our community, LEH and NEH. So for those of you who are new to One Book, One New Orleans, One Book selects one book every year, hence our name, and we bring together a community of readers. We believe our city is going to be stronger if we come together year after year after year through a shared reading experience. But in doing that, we have to realize that in our city of New Orleans, we have approximately a 27% functional illiteracy rate among our adults. So if we're going to be One Book, One New Orleans, we have to do an extra layer of outreach to make sure that folks who would normally be excluded from a community of readers are included. So we do that by developing a, cur a curriculum around the book and then distributing that curriculum and the book free of charge to adult education programs, to adults preparing for their high set exam, which is the high school equivalency exam, to adults in prisons, to juvenile detention centers for their high school and prison program, to incarcerated adults throughout Southwest Louisiana, and finally into the ears of our blind and print handicap community members through a partnership with WRBH Reading Radio, who will record our book cover to cover and broadcast it. And what is that book this year, you ask? It is New Orleans Griot, the Tom Dent Reader, edited by Kalamu Yasalam, who was a friend, a confidant, a mentee of Tom Dent. I cannot say enough things about this book, but what really struck me, I mean, you guys see how thick this is, right? It's very thick. And what struck me when I read the introduction was when Salam said, even I was unprepared, even though I knew him, I was unprepared for the sheer volume of work collected in the Tom Dent archive. There's so much book cover. And so we're here tonight to talk about some of that aren't in this book and to talk about how to collect and preserve a writer's work for future generations. The other thing that I found really surprising when I read this book was toward the end. So at the end, in an interview with, I think it was Dr. Jerry Ward, Tom Dent said, I'm really excited for some of these young writers coming up. And he mentions a few by name. And one of the people he mentioned was Tony Bolden. And I had to stop and I had to sit back because I had a professor named Tony Bolden when I was an undergraduate at the University of Alabama. And I knew that he was here and he'd gotten his PhD at Dillard. And so I Facebook messaged Tony Bolden. I said, are you this Tony Bolden? And he said, yeah, I am. I thought you knew that. I knew Tom Dent. I was in Black Art South. So when I first started thinking who would be the perfect moderator for this event, there's a no-brainer. It's Tony Bolden. So we're going to welcome Tony tonight, along with Chris Harder, who is the deputy director at the Amistad Research Center, where a lot of the Tom Dent papers are collected. And then we're also going to meet John Kennedy, who is an archivist with the Dillard University Library that also has their own Tom Dent collection. So take it away, Tony, Chris, and John. Hey, well, thank you, um, Megan, and uh, hello, uh, Chris and, and John. Hello, Dr. Holt. Um, Couple of things. Um, that was really gracious. Of, of always, you know, they go overboard. But couple, couple of things. Um, Dillard doesn't give PhD, so I got a, I got a bachelor's from Dillard, and um, I was too young 
for Black Art South that was so the, the workshop that I was a part of, I was the baby of the group and it was called Congo Square, which which included the core group of Black Art South. So, all right. Anyway, uh, what are we doing tonight? What do you what do you, what do you guys uh, have to share? So, so well, I'll let you uh, talk a little bit, but uh, you know, I think I think our goal tonight is to to share a little bit about. Uh, uh, Tom's life and work, uh, some of the work that went into uh, and became part of New Orleans Grio. Um, there's such a rich, um, uh, so many connections between um, the archives at Dillard, um, the Dent papers, uh, not only Tom's papers, but the, the Dent family papers at Amistad. Um, and I think as Megan was right, um, to me uh, personally, Writers' papers are such a fascinating um, subgenre of archives. Um, there's so much th that you can explore within those. So I, I say we dig into the papers and uh, and share a little bit about what we have. Yep. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be some overlap between Mr. Harder and myself, considering our collections are so closely tied. Um, but the, definitely what I would like everyone to leave with today is the importance of archives and everything we can we learn from archives and why they should be uh, uh, aggressively uh, uh, preserved. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. No questions. Why, why don't you guys go ahead and do that then? What? what okay, so I'll, I'll pose the question since we haven't had one. And it'll be a real easy one. So, so what's the what's the significance of an archive? How do you the difference between and we work at the library and the dealers? The difference people might not between. So you know, I know I'm having a little yeah, yeah. Working yeah. In, that in archive and, and so. in a library. So I, I kind of gathered uh, what uh, Dr. Bolden was trying to say. Um, what so basically what separates researching in, in an archive compared to, I guess your your, uh, your your typical reading in the library, correct? Well, well, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's the intricacies that you can discover about uh, said topic. Um, for instance, if it's, if it's the workings of a university, these are the behind the scenes things to where you can see how, uh, for instance, a university was formed, how it goes about its, uh, its, its, uh, its most important aspects. So archives is, 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 is the intricacies that, that allow for greater research. It's the, it's the behind the scenes. It's the, it's the nitty gritty, if you will. It's the... <laughs> Yeah, and oftentimes the archives is composed of, of primary sources, be they uh, photographs or scrapbooks, um, uh, correspondence. Oftentimes it's it's those materials that then go into the books that we find within the libraries. Um, you know, whether it's a, a book talking about the civil rights movement or the black arts movement or uh, particular writers' lives. You know, much like with uh, the New Orleans Grio, um, Kalama Yassalam spent days and days and days uh, at the Amistad Research Center just going through Tom's uh, drafts of, of a lot of his writings in order to kind of bring a little bit of order to, to the chaos that is a, a writer's archives um, and distill that down into a, a book that, that's then published, such as the New Orleans Grio. But, but archives can be, uh, you know, very intricate. Uh, they can be a, a, everything from a single item up to hundreds of feet of, of boxes of, of papers um, with all sorts of access points, all sorts of subjects that may not seem related, but through this individual's life, somebody like Tom Dent, they, they all come together because they're, they give an overview of, of his life and his work. And with, uh, with patience applied, you can you can learn so much from archives. I mean, it it, it takes it takes a, a great amount of work to 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 the, with the tedious research, if you will. But the things that you discover are well worth it. 
So, Christopher, how, how did you how did you come um, how did you become interested in town dense work? You know, it, it's funny. I, I was thinking about this today. I actually was was familiar with Tom's work long before I came to Amistad, um, many years before, and that was through my own professional uh, interest, um, my research, and actually my collecting in little magazines, the little literary magazines. Um, and I, my first kind of road into those was some of the um, magazines that Leroy Jones was editing in the 1950s, You Then Floating Bear. Um, and it's through those that I got to uh, be introduced to Tom through the Umber Writers Workshop, the, um, the collective that he was part of in New York City in the early 60s. Uh, so I was aware of Tom and, and, and knew his, his work, um, his, his editing and, and the writing that was coming out of the Umbra workshop. Um, to be honest, I had no idea that his papers were at Amistad until my very first day here. Um, I walked in, I'm being introduced to the staff, um, and I meet Florence Borders, who was a, a longtime archivist in New Orleans, uh, had worked at Amistad um, at uh, Southern University New Orleans for many years. Um, and when I met her, I, I asked what collection she was working on, and she said the papers of Tom Dent. And much like Megan said, be Tony Bolton, I said, be Tom Dent? And she said, yes. And she told me, and there were hundreds of boxes of, of his papers that she was in the midst of, of working it. And it, it, it's kind of funny. I knew Tom, I knew Tom from New Orleans. I knew he had New Orleans collections, but I always associated him more with the New York scene and with Umbra. And so being introduced to his wider collection of papers, his interest in the civil rights movement, his interest in music, of course, in writing. Um, it's just been a phenomenal collection to to dive into and, and to continue to explore uh, after many years here. Same question, John. How'd you get interested? Ironically enough, Dr. Bolden, um, my very first experience with Tom's work was actually as a as an intern for a short time working under Mr. Harder at the Amistad Research Center. So this 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 is my first time not only experiencing uh, Tom's work but also the work of an archivist. So so to see uh, not only his 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 personal belongings but also his writings, it was it was an eye opener. Yeah, he was. Uh very special thinker. Um, so I was a librarian at Dillard. And when I first started, I think Ms. Borders still worked. At that time, the archive was actually at Dillard. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Where is it now? Tulane? It's, it's on Tulane's campus. So we were... Um, the Amistad Research Center was founded in 1966 up at Fisk University um, up in Nashville. And the, the interesting thing about Amistad, um, it's been on three different college campuses, but never been formally a part of those universities. And it's always been a, an independent nonprofit. Um, that's the way it was at Dillard. It, it came from Fisk University, uh, actually at the invitation of Tom Dent's father, uh, Albert Dent, who was a president of Dillard, um, at, 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 for the, he was outgoing at that time. And so uh, uh, Amistad was on Dillard's campus for about 10 years, from 70 to 80. Um, and then we moved to uh, the, the old U.S. Mint down in the French Quarter, and then in the, in the mid-80s came to the, the campus of Tulane University. Um, but there's always been this strong connection between Amistad and Dillard and the, and the Dent family for, for many years. I see. All right. Are we going to get any questions? Then, there we go. What parts of the collections, both at Amistad and Dillard, were used for the Tom Dent Brio? Well, if I'm not mistaken, I know you can speak to more to this, Mr. Harder, but the majority was, was spent at uh, the Amistad Research Center. Yeah, that's where, that's where the, the majority of, of Tom's writings are. Um, everything from published works to drafts, um, handwritten drafts, type, typescript drafts. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty sure those, those composed the, the bulk of, of what went into the, the Grio leader um, here. And it's, and even with that, as, as Kalamiya Salam said, there's actually so much more that couldn't go into the book. You could probably have a, a multi-volume Tom Dent reader uh, just based on the, the scope of, of his work. He was so, and, and Mr. Boney, you, you can probably speak to this. I mean, he was such a, a prolific writer um, and I think one of the, the one of the things why Tom's work is not more well known is because he didn't publish as much, but certainly um, was very productive as a writer. And I think also working with other writers to help uh, uh, get their work out there and to uh, publicize their work and, and make those connections. Um, but as I said, there's even more than than that big thick. Uh, book. There's there's so much more in the in the record here uh, that reflects Tom's writing. And we do uh, here at Dilly, we do have uh, bound copies of uh, I don't know if you can see this, the Caillou, who which Tom was the editor, as as well as uh, our though our um, our holdings aren't as extensive as the Amistad's as far as Tom's, he, he does have uh, um, a standing collection here, or uh, tied into the Dent family collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that question was from uh, Laura Thompson. I'm, I'm sorry, I messed up there. Um, okay, so so Callaloo has uh, Callaloo has a story. Um, I think. Well, I'm sure Tom was uh, really. He played a very um, important role in uh, co-founding the journal. Um, I don't know if anyone um, out there has seen the very first issue, but you can really see his influence. So you can really see um, it, it reflects his vision, his sensibility, mm -hmm. and his concern for uh, developing, um, he was he was someone who built um, institutions, and he believed very strongly in the in the importance and functionality of black independent um, institutions and groups, etc. So, um, Callaloo was intended to serve that function particularly for uh, black Southern writers. And uh, to some degree it did, uh, but it, it, not so much some of the community kinds of things that he had in mind. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately uh, that, that, that journal becomes associated uh, with um, and becomes edited by Charles Rawl, who is the longtime, you know, editor of of, of Callaloo, and mo very few people outside of New Orleans actually know that Tom Dent played a really important part in um, founding that journal, along with Jerry uh, Jerry Ward, mm -hmm. uh, who's a very important uh, poet, scholar. Um, and all, all around, all around sage. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was one of my professors when I was a student here. I, Is that right? I had the pleasure of uh, having uh, Dr. Ward as a teacher. Well, you're very lucky. He was, um, he, he was, he was one of my unofficial, I guess you could say mentor in that sense. So I, 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 I benefited from a number of people. Um, including Kalamu, uh, Tom, mm -hmm. and, and Jerry. But Jerry was the one who, who basically told me to go to school. He was the one, I don't know if it was a good thing or not, but he was the one who's really, he's the culprit behind my decision <laughs> to attend graduate school. Yeah, yeah his, uh, his commitment to academic excellence is, I mean, you can't put words to it. Yeah. But uh, but his but the uh, the level of accountability he has for his students is 
it is not it's not meant to demean, but it's it's only because he wants you to succeed. And I, I and I appreciated him so much. Still to this day. Yeah. Well, I still think uh, the first of uh, what uh, did can you all hear me? Uh, uh you a little bit. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I think that the, the connection with my my internet might be might not be ideal, but I'll do the best I can. Um, in any case, uh, there are a number of factors. Part of it was, I thought Christopher's explanation is is helpful. Um, part of it is regionalism too, which which was one of the reasons why it was important for, for uh, you know, Tom felt it was important to do a journal. He had, they had already done uh, Nakumbo, um, some other, I think there was a Red River Journal. I can't remember that one. Mm -hmm. There was another one they did that was a beautiful uh, journal also, that, at least one issue that I saw. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and of course, he had um, co-founded on Umbra. So, uh, but there were there were regional issues still are. Mm -hmm. So you know the Northeast, the, the sort of the places that are recognized as capitals <clears throat> tend tend to uh, slime like, and then Tom's ideas tended to differ. Um, from a lot of folks, mm -hmm. um, and obviously he was so he was someone who made whose overall contributions, uh, whose who recognition in comparison to uh, the, the nature of, of his overall contribution, um, you know, and yeah, so that that's one way to. To think about it, um, but he loved New Orleans. He, he, mm -hmm. he really did. Yeah. And you, yeah, you can certainly see that in, in his writing and interests. I mean, his his work with the Free Southern Theater, um, Black Art South, um, and you're right that that idea of you know kind of finding ways to uh, express and and make better known um, uh, Southern writing, particularly. Uh, African American Southern writing, um, and to get away from these kind of dual coasts of the West Coast, East Coast, uh, there's only important writing coming out of there. What Tom was doing in the South and, and with others was really showing some of the wonderful work that was being produced um, and trying to, to make those well known through, you know, as you say, Callaloo and, and Black River Journal and Black Art South to really, really promote that and, and help folks understand the, the great work that was coming out of, of New Orleans and, and the South as well. Black River Journal, that's what it was. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that, that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful, I had an issue for a long time. It was it was just I, I don't think I've ever seen visually another literary magazine that looked quite like it. Yeah. And I don't think it lasted very long. Maybe maybe one issue, maybe two. Yeah, uh, it was very short. Typical for literary magazines. Yeah. That those those were hard to do because they were independent. They didn't get mm -hmm the funding, and he didn't want that, you know? He used to say, well, if people really want this or that, they're gonna have to pay for it. Yeah. You know, we have the uh, endowments, and particularly as a writer, he felt that that exerted a certain amount of control. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to be completely free. Very different idea than what's sort of common uh, today. He wasn't concerned with prizes right. or mm -hmm. accolades unless they acknowledged, you know, what, what he was doing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, um, let, well, let me ask you: are, are, Do you are is there footage of Tom Dent reading anywhere? Do you have anything at, at Dillard? I uh, I have a couple family pictures. That's 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 it. I know. In in Tom's papers, we have some audio, but now that you mm. mention it, in terms of video footage. I'm not sure if I if I've seen any. It, it may be his it, it, even his his audiovisual collection and all his, all of his oral histories and and things that that he would record the number of readings and conferences and such. Um, but I don't know if I've other than still photographs. I don't know if I've seen any footage of of Tom reading. Yeah, it's a great story. I did. I didn't actually know he had graduated from high school at 15 until just a few minutes ago. And I looked through, mm -hmm. um, you know, he used to talk about Gilbert Academy from time to time. That's the one thing about it. He was actually rather modest. He didn't draw a lot of attention to himself. You know, it's yeah. a very, again, <clears throat> it would be interesting to see uh, because today now it's about, uh, people talk about having a brand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and and he was he was the antithesis of that. <laughs> so he helping, yeah. else brand. <laughs> and helping everybody else with their brands, <laughs> right? That's true. That's what he would do. That's that's you know. So yeah, that's uh, I I used to teach Southern Journey. Uh, when I was a, uh, taught at the University of Alabama, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was quite an experience because this was mm, early two thousands, <clears throat> and a lot of those students um, were well, most of the black students were from Alabama, mm -hmm. and their aunts grandparents, great uncles and aunts um, had direct connections with the civil rights movement. Right. So, and what was interesting about the book is that um, it really reflected his philosophy in a number of ways. So he did not want, he told me he didn't want to do something with footnotes or that kind of, you know, that kind of book. Uh, he, he published fiction. Uh, told believe in the people he said um, are great storytellers and their experiences um, are, are interestingly and are interesting enough. Like you know what that they didn't have we didn't have to create fiction in our lives. If you think about what's going on now, you know, um, in the streets, uh, that's just a sort of dramatic thing. But so what he you know the, 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 I I it one of the things that's really disappointed me is the extent to which Southern Journey has been ignored. Mm -hmm. Um. When those young people read that book, I actually told it as a theoretical book. Mm. When they read it, um, it really it, it really sort of gravitated to it, and um, they started talking about, you know, various family members, etc. Um, but it, it's a book that that's re it, it it reads like. Mm -hmm. um, a memoir or a fiction, it has that kind of craft. Right. You know, and at the same time, it has the information that a scholar and the researcher journalist would have in the vision. It's a. Yeah. <laughs> It's really unfortunate that it that it went out of print. Yeah. 
No, you're right. I mean, there is such and 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 reading a, reading a lot of of kind of civil war civil rights um, uh, history. It definitely has a different type of narrative and flow to it. It is. It, it's almost like a, a series of, of conversations, and those were built off of the extensive oral histories. And if I remember correctly, Tom said that he didn't want to visit, you know, just concentrate on the Montgomery's, the Selma's, the Atlanta, right. but get to uh, some of the smaller towns and the rural areas and talk with the people who were um, uh, involved. And I think maybe that's, that's an aspect of why it, hasn't been read as much is it it doesn't have the it doesn't focus on the kind of the the big names or the the dr kings the um uh and and others um but it, the interesting thing about it is and this is this may be something that that what your students were speaking to is these are um Kind of the everyday individuals who were involved with the civil rights movement um and there probably were uh, uh, close connections or a, a few degrees of separation from from some of your students to these individuals, um, especially especially in Alabama. Um, but Tom was just an um, uh, extensive uh, oral history documentarian. Um, the the Southern Journey oral histories that he did. He did a series earlier focusing on Mississippi civil rights workers. Um, did a lot for Andrew Young's autobiography. Um, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of um, Tom's oral history here. <laughs> we, we sometimes joke, while he was incredibly prolific, um, from a technical standpoint, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, had a little to, uh, to be desired. But I mean, it, it seems like his oral histories were in restaurants, in bars, uh, in parks, on the highways as he's driving down. So that while the sound quality isn't always as, as great, they are just a rich resource of just sitting and, and listening to those. And we've, we've been fortunate at Amistad um, to be able to put some of those into the Louisiana Digital Library. So you can now go and listen online uh, to a lot of Tom's original uh, interviews that he did for, for Southern Journey. There's, and there's so much more in the interviews that, of course, he couldn't, uh, couldn't pack into the book. I'm going to come back to, you know, his method. But, John, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. So... Um, you know, I'm no, I'm no person now. So, you know, from someone from your perspective, in your age group, yes, sir. What do you think Tom has to offer for people in the 21st century coming up now, particularly with all of these things going on? How do you think? His words speak to the here and now. Well, one thing was for certain about uh, Tom Dent is that at, there was a specific time where he himself was trying to find out where he was useful, where he can find a way to make a difference, not only to the communities, but also what, what spoke to his spirit. What, mm -hmm. what, what it is that I want to do to give myself gratification. And I imagine his... Uh, his upbringing, if you will, presented certain pressures, but he he himself was a young black man trying to find a way. And reading his work, it, it spoke to me in the sense to where I I'm if I'm 33 years old, and there are times where I wonder, <laughs> I wonder where do I fit and how can I affect the greater community? What what can I do to to make a difference? And to to see that he himself, he and I separated from generation by generations, both had this thing to figure out. It was very comforting. And I imagine anybody that would like to indulge in his work would find the same comfort. Mm -hmm. If that answers your question, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, we're just free, free flowing here. Uh, you know, Christopher, you mentioned, uh, you know, where he wrote. His time would tell you, um, his favorite place was Denny. So, and he wrote in longhand. Yeah. He would go, he liked to buy these expensive pens. 
They were very exquisite. I could never get with the pens. I, I have a couple of uh, uh, Tom's pens in his papers. He liked the the Mount Blanc, the the really expensive that none of us can can afford to to purchase. But um, yeah, one of the things that we have is a lot of probably close to three hundred of Tom's journals. And one of the things that I always enjoy when a researcher comes and they say, "I want to I want to read Tom's journals." And we'll we'll bring them out. And we'll set them up. Some of them are, are quite fragile, and they'll open them up, and they kind of their eyes pop back because they've never seen the handwriting like Tom's before. Um, I don't know if folks can. I'll try and show that. But that's kind of an example of of Tom's handwriting. Yes, um, hundreds and hundreds of, of journals like this, and and oftentimes our staff has gotten pretty good at. Um, uh, translating uh, Tom, Tom handwriting to uh, uh, to researchers, but um, uh, journal writing was seems to have been such an important um, aspect of his writing. Um, uh, just the, the the notebooks and notebooks that he filled uh, throughout his life. But uh, didn't realize Guinea's was his favorite uh, his favorite writing spot. What's the thing? He, he was dry. He loved, he loved his different places. He'd go somewhere. He drive somewhere, and he would stop at Denny's and get a sandwich. And he had a whole, you know, ritual about what sandwich you would get. And he would stay there, and he would write in longhand. That's the old school, you know. And I, I suppose he. Translated later on to you know because this this is really before computers. I mean, they were around. Kalamu actually was one of the, you know, he was really early into the technology. Yeah. But Tom actually liked to go to go on the road, and he would he would write at Denny's, and he he'd actually. He actually told me one time about, I don't know if, if it was a brother or somebody he was, you know, rather close to, didn't quite know him as a writer. And he said, let, let me let me show you, you know, this is how I write. <laughs> That's what he would do, though. He would, he would get in his car and, and drive somewhere and go on the road. But, but and that's why... Southern Southern Journey, like I said, really it really exemplified Tom because everybody who knew Tom knew all somewhere. So he's in the book driving way in terms of the form of it. Um, you know, he, he is, I guess, a hybrid of different things, mm -hmm. but it the form is is isomorphic, if you will, with Tom's sensibility and his love for 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 traveling. He's always on the road somewhere. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, have either of you ever seen uh, any of his plays? Produced. I've seen Ritual Murder uh, a couple times here in New Orleans. Uh, produced. I, yeah, I have to. I, I have not, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably before your time. That's all. Um, but you know, he was actually, he actually was uh, quite prescient. Um, in in ritual murder, um, you have a, a character who's the police chief. Now, Tom himself didn't put this in, but Ron Castine, uh, who used to play that part at least for a long for many years, the person I used to know mm -hmm. who played that part. Um, but he actually inserted the lines, you know, because it's about, for people who don't know, it's you have at, at the a crucial point in the story, um, 
the police chief talks about his uh, way of solving the problem of quote unquote black black crime and and basically it's a miller militaristic approach mm -hmm. and ron castine would interpolate would insert the line we need tanks <laughs> <laughs> and of course you see um obviously that that was again that tom didn't say that yeah but the concept was so clear that the actor understood it well enough, and it always worked. You know, I, I, I talked, I, I mentioned this to to Chakula Chagua, you know, the great director, and he said, "Well, you know, you know, you know, no, Tom, that's not in there. Tom didn't write that." But I said, "Okay, you know, but I, I think in a, in a way, it's even in some ways it's more revealing that he didn't write it that." Yeah. The, the actor playing the part understood right. the concept well enough to interpolate it. And again, the crowd, it will always work with the crowd. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but he was, he, he wrote, he wrote in just about everything. He wrote poetry. Um, he wrote, uh, he published um, fiction. And um, just a just just a a, a very important uh, contributor right. um, to black writing and black culture generally. Right. So. And and as you said, there's um, you know so much so much of his, his writing that uh, I think many people um, haven't um, been exposed to because it's it's still in manuscript form. Um, uh, you know, just uh, just a couple uh, collections of poetry, but there's so much more um, uh, in his papers uh, here. Um, it'd be it'd be great to see not only uh, you know the Tom Dent reader the as, as the the prose work, but uh, a Tom Dent reader with the the poetry as well to uh, to help introduce that work as well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he, he. One of the things that got my attention when I, <clears throat> when I knew him, I, I was an athlete when I was a kid, and I grew up, uh, for the most part, in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, and you know, for those of us from that time period, we played baseball, um, and so everybody was in the Willie Mays, and you know, he had a line about Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. I said, you, you you write poems about you know Willie Mays, and he, he he never forgot that. But that was something, you know. He 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 wasn't in the audio, in the interview between or the conversation between uh, Tom Den and Kalamu Yasalam. Um, they're talking about the tensions in Umbra, mm -hmm. and it seemed like. Kalama would ask him something about um, ideology and um, political philosophy, and Tom Dent responds, well, yeah, you know, some of the members felt that there should be something rather definitive or more definitive, but for him, um, that wasn't, that wasn't important, you know, for, you know, you know, for him, and yet he was, he was at the same time, I think it's important to note, uh, he told me this very, very pointedly. He was, he did, he, 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 want, he believed that writing was political. So there's a difference between sort of being dogmatic, mm -hmm. right? And writing having political significance, which I took to be his point. Right. Um, so, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why, again, um, because a lot of the stuff that he's talking about, particularly in, in Southern Journey, um, we've already mentioned um, ritual murder, those contradictions that he's, he's uh, sort of engaging as he's driving uh, during the first uh, Iraq war, those are front and center today. Mm -hmm. And you, 
you know, and he, he is, his reading of those contradictions, the jingoism and all of that, it, he, he understands where it's going at a time when relatively few intellectuals were talking about it in any substantive way. You know, it, it, you didn't get, you get a whole lot of, you know, you didn't get a whole lot, of, you, you couldn't get, build a brand on that. <laughs> you know, um, that was a different time. You know, so. yeah, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a subtlety in his work. I was reading um, report from New Orleans not long ago, and it, as we're talking about, you know, kind of, you know, how would how would Tom Dent uh, fit into the 20th first century, you know, uh, with especially with with things going on today, and read back reading back over that, it's kind of a a, a, a small prose piece, almost like a, a prose poem um, in his first um, collection and just rereading it. And, and there are parts of it that you would think I'm reading about New Orleans today, not back in the mid seventies while, you know, when he was writing it. Um, and it just, it, it kind of struck me. It had been a while since I'd read that piece of just how it was speaking to today um, and how Tom, as you were saying, was was so prescient of, of being able to see, um, in, in many ways, unfortunately, some of the things that are still going on and and some of the issues um, that Tom was trying to time trying, trying to address then um, that he I think he'd still be trying to address today. I agree. Yeah. Well. Um, why don't we stop now, um, and see if, um, there are any questions, um, that people, um, might want to pose. Mm -hmm. All right. So Malik Bartholomew has a question. Can each archive explain what their archives have on Dent? Um, um, Mr. Harder, you you mind if I pull up my yeah, yeah uh, right, right ahead. Okay. Well, I I considering um our scope here um as far as time dense is an extent as an, is as extensive as Amistad's. It, it, we have one here uh, dedicated to time, but in in prep in preparing for this particular panel. I thought it was appropriate to to gather more so uh, the information on uh, the Dent family collection just to get set a context of of, of, of where Tom came from. Uh, it's uh, the workings of his father and his mother. Um, and and uh, let me pull this up here. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, this this my my objective wasn't to to take the focus off of time and all of the wonderful things that he's done, um, but just to give a context of where he came from, um, what 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 things he may have seen day to day, um, but also the importance of what we can learn from an archive, and and and. To, to better understand, if, if one were to study Dilley University, you have no choice but to study the workings of Albert W. Dent. He, he, it was through his workings to which uh, this university grew to a, um, an academic, uh, uh, an institution of academic excellence uh, throughout, the, throughout the United States. Um, but just, just, just to show that, um, what I, what I, not to, like I said, to reiterate, not to take the focus off of Tom's workings, but to just to show where Tom came from and, and um, to show that um, there's a letter between he and uh, his father um, after uh, his first semester at uh, college. Wow. His, uh, his father actually uh, began working at Dillian University in, uh, in 1932. Um, uh, to, give, to give a little background, uh, Dillian University is the, is the culmination of two other HBCUs, which is uh, Stray College as well as as well as New Orleans University, and when their merger was official, the first operating component of their merger to open was a brand new um, Flinger Ridge Hospital. Um, Flinger Ridge had already been in existence, but this new 
uh, the new hospital built uh, uh, within, uh, near what is now today the Magnolia Projects um, was a symbol of that merger. And uh, the president of the Board of Trustees at Dillard University chose a very young 28-year-old man, L Albert W. Dent, to be its superintendent. And, and it's it through and, and once again the focus on archives. Um within Dr. Dent's writings as superintendent of, of the hospital, you find so many different important issues that they're trying to combat within New Orleans and as well as Louisiana. Um this here is a is a, an excerpt from um one of one of those reports. This is uh Dr. Dent laying out that there's a um, a mortality issue uh, with infant, uh, with African American um, mothers and, and children, um, it, and, and it was through their studies that they find out there there was a uh, a comfortability with uh, black women using midwives as compared to coming to a hospital. So he he's writing to to uh, he's he's letting the board know that hey we need to find an issue to to this problem. Flint Gurich needs to find an issue to this problem. And you can see, fast forward to 1941, you can see as the hospital began to offer different uh, forms of education on, on midwifery to help with the problem, you can see that the, the, um, the mortality rate actually was reduced. Also, uh, to come from uh, the 1941 superintendent uh, report, you see that there's an absence of nursing education. Uh, at one time, Flint Gurus got, they had a nursing training program, but uh, they got rid of it. Um, and Dr. Den is, is consistently writing in his reports throughout the years that this a particular form of nursing education is needed in, in order to fill the needs not only of uh, New Orleans, but, uh, but African-Americans in Louisiana. Being, being that there were no significant programs um, within between Texas and Georgia um, uh, 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 as far as nursing. Uh, Dr. Dent served in many different capacities uh, for, for Dilly University. Uh, simultaneously, he, uh, once, once, this, once this entity here, this campus opened which in 1935, they hired him and you can see his picture down on the bottom left. Um, this is an announcement from uh, the Louisiana Weekly. Um, he was hired as the business manager. So you have uh, an early 20s, I'm, I'm sorry, a late 20s, early 30s young man S serving as the, a superintendent of a, of a major African American hospital and a business manager of a uh, of a new university. This is this this is uh, earlier when I mentioned about behind the scenes, the intricacies of uh, finding out things in archives. I, I wanted specifically to point out this this letter. This letter here is from Fred Brownlee, who's a member of Dilly University's Board of Trustees. And he's writing to the president of the board in Edgar B. Stern. And this is in 1940. Um, Dr. Dent's uh, predecessor um, at this point, uh, William Stewart Nelson, is he, he's checked out. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's completed everything he can for the university and gave it a wonderful foundation. So now he wanted to move on to different things. So now you have the board going back and forth, like, well, who? What's the combination we're going to choose between uh, between uh, president and dean of students? And you can see here that Brownlee is telling that despite Charles, uh, uh, they're talking about Charles S. Johnson as well as uh, Dr. Dent. Mm -hmm. And there, and you see Brownlee saying that despite Johnson may being, uh, I guess, a better fit as president, but Dent has something special that you can't deny. And uh, one thing about uh, the president of the board, uh, of, of board of trustees, Edgar uh, B. Stern, he actually wanted Dr. Dent to be Dillard's first president. Um, but the board at the time thought Dr. Dent was too young. But it, uh, he was selected to be Dillard's uh, president. He wound up being Dillard University's longest standing president. You may uh, you may hear all, more often than not that Dr. Dent is the man to uh, to to build Dilly. He's the he's the president to build Dilly. So this though this picture is from 1939, I brought this out for a specific reason. This uh, so the campus didn't change much in 1941 when he actually uh, assumed the presidency. So fast forward 16 years later, and this is Dilly's campus. 
so you you see why he's given the the the, the title of the man who built Diller. And fast forward a couple more years later, you get a couple more buildings. So you have you have here a man who was very who he was very heavily invested in the university in which he was president and very committed to the, to its excellence. This 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 particular picture says so much, um, not only about uh, the university, but so much we can learn from one one particular piece in uh, from an archive. And this is something that was just recently in our unprocessed materials um, that uh, that we came across a couple of days ago. Um, what you see here, and, and this is also going to tie back to uh, something in Flint, uh, what I was mentioning about the nursing program in Flint Goodrich. This here is the very first nursing capping ceremony, which would, if you want to equivalent equivalent equated to something today, it would be our nursing pinning ceremony here at the university. So this is the very first class of nurses mm -hmm. at the university, and this is their first ceremony. And these things I found within Dr. Dent's unprocessed materials. From this picture, you see not only the first graduate classes of nursing, but some of the earliest nursing faculty, but the, the hall in which they're in is uh, an original chapel, which was housed in Rosenwald Hall, which is the university's administration building prior to the university building um, its, uh, its current day uh, lawless memorial chapel. And these are a couple shots of the early nursing, uh, the, the first class in their, within their courses. And these are also things that I, uh, I uh, uncovered through uh, Dr. Dent's unprocessed materials. Uh, a woman who who needs to be talked about more is uh, Mrs. Dent, Mrs. Mrs. Jessie Covington Dent. Um, she she wasn't just Dr. Dent's wife. Um, she was a renowned uh, musician, but also she championed fundraising here at this university, and she actually formed an organization dedicated to uh, fundraising uh, scholarship money um, for for students here at the university. It was called the Dillard's Women's Club. This here is a sh uh, shot of a cookbook that the club made as a fundraiser. And if you can see on the on the picture on the right, some of the recipes from these particular friends of the university that that sent in recipes for the cookbook. But it also shows the ties that the dents had. And uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, Professor Zella Palmer here at the university, she she did a modern day rendition uh, of this particular book and it's, it's wonderful. And to reiterate, Mrs. Dent was a champion of, of fundraising. So Flint Gorich had uh, what needed, a, um, needed some funds raised. So she, she took it upon herself to make, uh, to, to make this fundraising event for the uh, for Flinger's Heart Hospital, um, the Ebony Fashion Fair. So, what initially started out as a fundraiser for an African American hospital blossomed into one of the greatest um, showings and events of uh, African American fashion in this country. And this is the work of Mrs. Dent, the Ebony Fashion Fair. So these, those were just a couple of things just to set. So the, I just wanted, I wanted to bring out those particular things just to show the importance of archive, but also to show um, Tom's, uh, Tom's background. Mm -hmm. um, his father was well-connected, very young. And Dillard was always known for um, civil rights icons, um, emperors of countries coming to the university. And, and so these are things that Tom's seen. So I, I, I could imagine it affected him in a, in a very, you know, a numerous, a numerous ways. So John, and I think, you, I think you speak well of the importance of both um, Tom's father and mother um, in his, his growing up and, and kind of who he became. Um, I mean, in, in Tom's papers at, at Amistad, um, it's approximately 240 boxes of not only his writing, but a lot of the um, 
community and, and artistic projects that he was a part of, whether it was whether it was Jazz Fest, whether it was the Congo Square uh, Writers Workshop, um, Free Southern Theater, Black Art South. Um, so he, he kind of, you know, I wouldn't necessarily describe Tom as kind of a, a businessman, but he, he had this organization uh, skills that he would, he could be a leader in, in these different projects, much, much like his father. But he certainly certainly got his interest in the arts uh, from his mother. And as, as um, a number of people have said, he was he was very close to his mother. Um, and you can see that actually. So at Amistad, we had not only Tom's papers, but the Dent family papers um, that um, document a lot of the, the Dent and the Covington family history. Um, but you can also tell there was there was this aspect of, of uh, Tom's mother wanting to document his, uh, his career and, and his writing. But I often describe uh, Tom's papers as kind of like a, a star amongst a constellation of stars and that there are so many related collections. They almost form this picture puzzle of Tom shows up in the records of the Free Southern Theater, um, the records of Nakumbo Publications, um, his contemporaries such as uh, John O'Neill's papers, um, as well as in, as, as you were talking, John, in the, in the Dent family papers, you get such um, wonderful views into the formation of a particular HBCU in, in the, the eventual formation of Dillard. Um, but also kind of African-American education uh, more broadly, but also medical history with the foundation of Flint Goodrich and its importance um, uh, to the city. Um, so there's so many ways, there, there's, there's so many access points that you can, that you can approach uh, with Tom and the, and the Dent family papers. But John, one of the important things that you said is you talked about um, uh, unprocessed um, paper. And maybe maybe explain a little bit about what is it when we as archivists talk about unprocessed papers, um, what are we what are we talking about with that? Oh, you you oh, I thought you were going to explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my bad. I'm sorry. I thought you were. Uh, but um, no. Uh, to uh, unprocessed materials is the things that aren't readily readily. Well, we're we're in the process of making more accessible to the public. It's things that we know that is there, but the public doesn't. Into it, and it's up to us to to uh, present it in a way that it's also um, safest, but uh, but to, in order to make it more accessible for the public. Um, and uh, I'm glad you uh, actually asked that. Um, um, the scope of which we have, um, well, Dillard, Dillard is 150 plus years old. It's legacy, um, and there, and it's in the in the holders and archive reflect that um, here at Dillard. But Dr. Dent has roughly um, from 1940, not 1941 to 1969, this, despite it not spanning hundreds of years, Dr. Dent's processed and unprocessed material takes up a great deal of our archive. And in and, 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 and this very telling of how active he was um, and, how, and, how, and how involved he was in so many different things nationally and locally. Um, but to reiterate, um, when we say unprocessed, it's things that we're working to get to the public that have that that haven't been attached to a finding aid per se. We know we have it. You don't know we have it, and we're trying to get it to you. Yeah, and and that's part of what we do as archivists is is not only preserve this material, but but work to uh, make it available. We do have a uh, an online finding aid for uh, Tom's papers, um, the Dent family papers. Those are mostly organized, but there's not an online finding aid. But um, some good news, probably within the um, next year, we're going to have uh, online finding aids for for all of the Dent family papers as well to to accompany Tom. So at Amistad, that's something that we're really excited about um, to to see those more widely available as well. All right. Are there any other questions? Um out in the audience. I thought, did we just, I thought I just saw a question and then it, okay. So Megan Holt has a question. Uh, what is my favorite memory of Tom Dent? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, 
A lot of them. I think probably for me, um, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll pick two. Well, the one when he actually told me, you know, that he thought I had potential as a writer. So that was, that's a, that's a really important. Um, he said I, I, I wrote, he, he liked the way I dealt with language. He used the word gusto, that, that I, I have a lot of gusto, you know, I, I, that, that was, that's a, that was a biggie. Um, but something he told me about writing um, Southern Journey before, because, you know, I actually saw uh, drafts, uh, early drafts. Mm -hmm. And um, he said he read every, every book on oral history. Um, I don't remember how he finished the sentence. Maybe every book that was available, every book that was public, but he he was he was uh, was very thorough, mm -hmm. and so that that's those are the two things that that um, I remember. Yeah. So yeah, at, at Amistad, we're fortunate to not only have Tom's papers, but uh, to have his personal library of about sixteen hundred titles. Uh, our catalog here as well, and there, and it's 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 many of the things that you would would think uh, that Tom would have. Of course, it's it's a wonderful collection of 20th century African American writing, a lot of small presses, broadside press, Lotus Press, uh, ones like that. But um, uh, there's an aspect of Tom being a sports fan, so we have all these Major League Baseball and National Football League annual guides that Tom was going through and, and making notes on um, and and things that you wouldn't expect, uh, 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 you know, collection of, of Plato or Aristotle, but Tom's, you can see Tom going through and making notes. You, you, you see a lot of his interest in, in his library as well. So I'll have to, I'll have to go back and look and see what we have anything on, on oral histories. I'm sure we have them here. Oh, that's one thing I can appreciate Tom, about Tom Dennis is his human, his, his humanity. Um, he, we know him as an icon, but uh, his humanity speaks to me so much uh, outside of, uh, you know, his, his, his writings. And that's one thing I think I, I appreciate most about him. How, Megan has another question. How can we visit the archives at your university? Um, well, uh, considering uh, the precautions with COVID, um, Usually I would accept um, walk-ins, but now uh, sit, I, I can leave my email and it, you just set up an appointment. I'll, I'll let DUPD know um, that you're coming to visit the archive, um, but they have to, it has to be, uh, it has to go through them uh, to just uh, with the precautions of COVID and I'm only doing um, uh, appointments only, no walk-ins. Yeah, and Amistad is, is much the same at, at, at this point. The, the pandemic has really changed um, a lot of the ways that we, we work with researchers and, and visitors. Um, typically, we would, we would be anyone could um, stop by. Uh, it's always good to make an appointment, but in, in the past, you could stop by and work with our staff to, to connect with the collections. But much like John says, we're in the, in the same situation that we are um, by appointment only at this point. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we're working with is that, uh, as I said earlier, we are on the campus of Tulane University. So we're following some of their precautions and, and protocols and they are um, uh, really focusing on, on kind of working with staff and, and faculty and, and students of Tulane, but Amistad is we're a, a much more community facing organization. Uh, we're trying to work with them to make sure we can still work with researchers who are coming from from off campus as well. Um, but even with that, um, you can call or email Amistad, um, our research services staff, uh, Lisa Moore and Philip Cunningham um, are building all number of questions and trying to, to help provide reproductions or photocopies mm -hmm. of 
material to help uh, service folks who may not be able to come onto campus or may be able to, even if they're outside of New Orleans, maybe may not be able to or wanting to travel uh, to do the research right now. But we've also been fortunate to, um, uh, as I said, we've been able to digitize some of Tom's uh, oral histories. Those are available through the Louisiana Digital Library. Um, but we also have through the uh, Google Cultural Institute, uh, a wonderful exhibition on Tom's life and career. Um, and that can be found by going either to our website, uh, amistadresearchcenter.org, um, under our public programs and exhibitions uh, section, or you can go directly to uh, artsandculture.google.com, just type in Tom Dent or Amistad Research Center to the search bar, and it'll uh, pop up that exhibition that you can view that gives a good view of not only Tom, but uh, Tom's family as well. And I do like, I do want to give a shout out. Uh, uh, I see Tom's uh, brother, Ben Dent, uh, there he is, is listening in. Hello, Ben, great to see you and, and thanks for joining us tonight. So he said, I want to thank all three of you for your insightful discussion of Tom and the Dent family. Um, and he said, his daughters are watching. Uh, thank you, sir. And um, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that is it. Um, it doesn't get much better than that, right? So <laughs> that's, that's an excellent way to put a stamp on it. So, uh, well, thank you uh, for inviting uh, Megan, and uh, you know, thank uh, you, John and Christopher. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was such a pleasure. Yeah. I look forward to talking with you again, Doctor Bowen. Indeed, indeed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anytime. Yes, sir. <laughs>